All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. We've got some more folks coming on, but I am recording this so that we'll have a recording that we'll be able to make sure that if someone misses part of this or if, they, if you want to look at it again, you'll be able to. So thank you for being with us today. Uh, my name is John Bass. I'm the Chief Operating Officer with AESA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, How to Thrive in Times of Challenge. One of the things we know about today is it is definitely a time of, of challenge for sure. Uh, our presenters today are from our newest AESA, or actually from our newest AESA business partner, Naturally Slim. Uh, we're so fortunate to have them as a partner in this space of physical and, and mental wellness. Uh, we, we know it's going to be an asset to be working with them, for, with our members and the school districts that they serve as well. We know this is a big issue right now as, as folks deal with uh, all the issues that they're that they're facing uh, across the country. And we know that some of the ways that you're having to serve your clients now creates even more mental and physical fatigue, even if you're not traveling as much or being out as much. Uh, we know that it's a, a big challenge. And that's why one, that's one of the reasons we're very fortunate to have folks, business partners like Naturally Slim. They're really the only folks we have in this space. And we're so fortunate to have them with us. Naturally Slim works with thousands of clients across the country. They work with hundreds of school districts and uh, other organizations as well. We're just glad that they have chosen and, and it worked out for us to be able to, to introduce them to our members. Uh, I know we've had Todd Whithorn, who's with us today, has been with us a few times with some of the events that we've had. So you may recognize Todd for those that were at our summer leadership conference. But along with him, he, he is the chief inspirational officer with Naturally Slim. We have Dr. Dana Labatt, who is a clinical psychologist we're so glad to have both of them with us today. We really appreciate the partnership we have with Naturally Slim. And I know you're gonna to find today's session to be of value to you both personally and also for your organization and, and also the clients that you serve. I mean, ESAs across the country have multiple uh, folks that they work with, different uh, constituents that they work with. And we know that this is something that, that can help you as well. So Todd and Dana, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Uh, like I said, we are recording this, so it'll be available later on. But at this time, Todd, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Awesome, John, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, good morning slash afternoon for, uh, to everyone on the call. And, and I think we've got a great size group today that we're gonna be able to hopefully have a conversation as opposed to a presentation. Because if you're like, I think most professionals these days were a little bit zoomed out. so. Let's not do a PowerPoint. Let's just have a conversation. And as John pointed out, um, Dr. Dana Labat is, is our partner in crime, one of our psychologists that's a part of our program. Just real quickly, uh, you know, Naturally Slim is, a, is an organization that delivers a, a behavioral program that helps people with their emotional and their physical well-being. So we, as John pointed out, we work with thousands of organizations across the country, a lot of them in the edu education space, K through 12. We have hundreds of school districts that we work with. Uh, and we also do a lot of work in higher education. So we're excited to, to spend some time with you today. Our, our goal is, uh, again, as John pointed out, we just wanna hopefully give you some tools and some uh, ideas and things to think about that will will have a positive impact on you personally, but also on your organizations and the ones that you serve. Um, before we get started and before I introduce Dr. Labatt, I have to ask Beth, You, I, I heard briefly there, Beth, that that picture was taken yesterday. Where are you? I'm in Nebraska. Whereabouts? Uh, Northeast Nebraska. Awesome. And I don't know if you saw my post in the uh, chat, but I was out of power for just about two hours and just came back on, so. Oh, well, good, good timing, <laughs> good timing. Hey Jeff, how about you? Where are you? You're you're in the library, it looks like. Well, well, that's that's true. I'm in the library in the basement. If you wanted to see my basement, uh, that's just a you know a background sc screenshot. Uh, awesome. I, I live I live in uh, South Central Pennsylvania, just about an hour uh, um, south southwest or northwest of Philadelphia. Excellent, excellent. And, and you've kind of been in the news of late, uh, your geographical region, right? Yes, we have been, haven't we? <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, been, it's been crazy, um, you know, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not sure where you guys are from, but, uh, you know, Philadelphia, everybody was boarding up their stores, people were putting plywood up, it was, it was, it was crazy. Um, yeah, so hopefully yeah. we're all past that now and uh, we can get back to some semblance of reality. 
Yeah, <laughs> whatever, whatever that looks like. And Becky, I can't see you, but uh, welcome wherever you might be. And, uh, you know, we're again, would love to open this up just as a conversation. So I'm in Dallas, Texas, actually a suburb called Coppell, Texas, right outside of Dallas. That's where our company is headquartered, uh, although we have employees spread all over the country. And on our clinical team, uh, our team of on-camera educators that, that we deliver our content to our, our clients uh, is Dr. Dana Labat, who I mentioned, a clinical psychologist from New Orleans, although did a bit of her academic training uh, here in Dallas as well. And I've known Dana for well over 10 years and, and she is a extremely gifted and talented human being. And uh, so I'll just write up front full transparency we're, we're great friends, but I will tell you professionally, she is, she is terrific. So um, Dana, let's, let's kind of jump in if we can, because uh, I like to look at the world as pre-March and post-March, right? Because somewhere in the middle of March of 2020, uh, I identify it as March the 11th, as, as Mike Tyson used to say, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Well, we all kind of got punched in the mouth by COVID-19. Uh, around March the 11th, give or take. And I think when it first happened, we were a little bit stunned. Um, and then probably if I'm speaking for most folks and I've talked to thousands of people in the past several months, they, they thought this probably wasn't gonna last all that long. And here we are eight months later um, and we still are in a race and we don't know where the finish line is. So with uncertainty, with concern, with fear, and certainly as, as we've talked about in the past, People in the worlds of, world of education, their world has been turned upside down professionally. So as a practicing psychologist, if we were all coming in mass today to come have a, have a meeting with you in your, your office, uh, where should we start about thinking about where we are right now? Well, I think first off, um, you know, we'd be doing exactly this, which is what I do for hours at a time. You guys all know, I mentioned to John earlier, I mean, staring at the camera, staring at the computer all day long. A big part of um, what I do talk to my clients about right now is, is to do a bit of an assessment of where they are and where things have been because our whole lives have been upended in so many different ways. Just how we function on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to, you know, like I said, I'm doing telesessions. I'm usually rip roaring and ready to get in my office and have someone have a body in front of me. And I, I, I miss that. <laughs> I miss that interaction. I miss, you know, walking down the hallway and talking with a colleague if I can. So what I first start with my clients and talking about is where they are right now. And a big part of that is the acknowledgement of um, of, of what things look like and what normal looks like now and how much it's changed from how things have been before. Getting that inventory, I think, is the first place to start. Tell me a little bit, if you would, and I'm monitoring the chat as well. So again, we've got a, a size group here. If any of you guys have any thoughts or questions, just jump on in. There's no need to, to chat about it, um, or at least through the dialogue box. Um, the it seems that initially, obviously, we had the concern of the pandemic, of the virus. Right. Now we add to that, we've got an economy that is a little bit on its, on its heels. Uh, we have social and racial unrest. We have political unrest, uh, even though that appears, as, as Jeff pointed out, maybe we're, we're hopefully getting that resolved to a degree. But I, I firmly believe that there's gonna be an aftermath for all of this, even if we get a vaccine in the first quarter of next year, we're still gonna have a lot, of, a lot of residue. What is what what has been from your standpoint the biggest concern? Is it fear? Is it uncertainty? What are the emotions that maybe we haven't felt in the past that we're feeling now? Well, I think the uncertainty definitely is one of those feelings as we're all trying to adjust and adapt as best as we can. You know, as you and I discussed earlier, this is, there isn't a finish line here, right? We don't know when things are going to end. And so that, that exhaustion is part of what we're emotionally experiencing. It's emotional exhaustion. It's a uh, physical exhaustion, you know, staring at the, we're staring right now at, at another screen for another hour, right? It's, it's the exhaustion of, um, of just trying to get through the day to day. And that's been an ongoing experience. And so the uncertainty I think has been there and people are getting 
kind of worn down by that uncertainty and that that worn down feeling persists. And then it's also just kind of dealing with the, the tiredness of it all and trying to find ways where we can, um, we've got to, we've got to be really, uh, again, resourceful in finding ways to instill bits of hope because so many things have really challenged that. So some of those new feelings that, that we've experienced, probably the ongoing exhaustion, the fatigue of it all, you know, wanting things to go back to normal. So that urging, that desire for things to get back when we don't really know what's coming next. I mean, we did get some hopefully good news, right, about uh, potential vaccine, you know, being in the works. We know that there's a lot of that going on, but we're still waiting. We're still, we're still in a holding pattern in a lot of ways, you know, and I think the other part too is, um, is incorporating that concept of flexibility. I mean, as educators, right. And as leaders, you, you are tasked with trying to find new innovative ways, creative ways and ways to kind of keep people as engaged as possible in order to be as effective as possible. And that also, I think has worn people down especially in a game where the rules keep changing That's because uh, uh, you know I've, I've said that it's it's pretty amazing at least from my perspective in my lifetime this is my first pandemic so we're all in the same storm uh, but what I've learned is we're all in different boats mm -hmm. and uh, being based in Texas and doing a lot of work with the service centers uh, here the 20 different service centers and recognizing that you know this is this is a global issue but really it's very much of a local problem. So the, the case rates, the hospitalization rates, the death rates, all of those things are ebbing and flowing as we all know by now, we've all become kind of amateur epidemiologists. Um, one of the things that I, you know, I, I think is that I've learned through this is that one of my favorite quotes is from Epictetus who a long, long time ago says, it's not what happens, but how you handle it that matters. Mm -hmm. So we can't, and you know, couldn't and can't control the virus right now. But there are things that we can control and having a sense of control is important for an individual, is it not? It is. And the way that I look at it, especially when I'm talking with, with my clients and, and even sometimes with myself is, you know, I try to take like a coping inventory. How is it that I am handling what's presented in front? right? How is it that the people that I work with, you know, whether it's colleagues like you, Todd, my clients around me, as well as even family members, what is it that we're facing individually as well as collectively? And how then are we coping with that? And um, to your point, there are only, there are things that we can control and there are many things that we can't control. And the things that we can't control, a big step, as I mentioned before, is the acceptance piece. It's figuring out what it is that we can control and what we can't. And sometimes when we've identified, when we've been, been able to go through an inventory in a sense of what we can control and what we can't, then it's being able to figure out how then do we let go of those things that we can't, right? For example, we can't control outcomes of elections. We can't, well, we vote, of course, that's one way, but once the numbers are being counted, we can't control any of that. But we do control how much exposure we have to news media, for example, especially if that happens to be a trigger for you. We can control, as I had a client who said, I took off a week of work, I took off a week of work for relaxation, and I've spent every day staying up, staying up till about 2 a.m. watching the news. <laughs> So I said, so, so where did that, where, where did that plan get you, <laughs> you know, and, and part of it is what can you control? And we, and we walked through, you know, we walked through turning the TV off, being able to decide I can control how much time I spend with the people that I care about. I can control that. So that's where I'm going to assert my time and attention. That's where I'm going to focus my area. And after you've done that inventory in terms of what is it that you can and cannot troll you decide how it is that you're coping and what those strategies are that you're using. And once you do that, one of the key things I always talk about is control is based on what you can do with your hands, your feet, and your mouth. So for a client who's depressed, for example, and guys, we've all been, we've, and I'd love for people to, to share their feedback, but we have all, we've all experienced angst and anxiety as a result of the pandemic and whatever's happening. What we can control is not necessarily how we feel about it. I always tell clients, you can't control that. 
I wish we could turn off a switch just like we can with the television, but we can't always do that. But we can control how we respond to it, just like your quote says. We can control how we respond to it. We can control utilizing those skills and resources and tools that oftentimes help us gain a sense of grounding and put our feet back on the ground. And sometimes that means talking with a colleague and just expressing, wow, this is a really big challenge that I'm facing right now and I don't really know what to do. So in order to, in order to get the support, you reach out. That's something that you can control. You can pick up the, you know, pick up, um, you know, we talk about how our age is, right? M most people are thinking, I pick up the phone and they're doing this. And I'm like, we pick up the phone and we do <laughs> Because this is how we talk to people, okay? <laughs> but you pick up the phone and you call it, you phone a friend, right? You know, you phone a friend, you talk to a colleague, um, you go outside, you exercise. Those are the things we can can do to control, even when we can't always control the emotional experience that we have. And we can't always control other people's behaviors too. Boy, that's so important. And that, that boy, there's so many different ways I want to go. And again, uh, First of all, Lori, welcome to the welcome to the club, and and Jeff and Beth and Becky. If you guys have any any thoughts or questions, what what you just kind of mentioned, uh, you know, controlling those around us. We're we're heading into the holidays, and for many many people, the holidays are the best time of the year. It's what they look forward to. It's awesome. They have lots of family traditions or or rituals, however you want to look at it. it oftentimes, we'll start with Thanksgiving, but for other people, it's a really tough time of the year. Sure. And we know that things that that have always been there, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, loneliness, these kind of things sometimes become a little bit exacerbated during the holidays. And this is going to be our first pandemic holiday, yeah. um, and which means routine schedules, uh, plans are going to be turned upside down. What strategies should we employ to, to manage that? Well, I think, as you mentioned, plans being turned upside down, planning is incredibly important, right? Cl planning and the ability to be a little bit flexible, to be adaptive. Um, lots and lots of articles are coming out, you know, news articles are talking about what to do to prepare for the holidays, six feet apart, try to space out if possible. Well, I don't know about you in Pennsylvania, Nebraska, right? But that might be a little challenge, be a little challenging if there's snow outside or it's pretty cold. But we've got to figure out the best ways to be adaptive, to be able to change and adjust. And I think that um, it's also important to just acknowledge that our feelings are real and we are expecting our traditions. Remember, everything has been upended. Everything has been turned on its nose. And as a result of that, it's okay to, it's okay to be sad. <laughs> right? It's okay to be disappointed that things aren't going to always be exactly how we wanted them to be or how we plan. Some people may plan all year long or, you know, several months in advance for the holidays because it's their favorite time of the year. Other people might um, look at the holidays and want to avoid it like a pandemic, right? I was about to say the plague, you know, but avoid it like a pandemic. So in a sense, we have to be we have to acknowledge and accept that it's okay to feel however it is that we feel about it. And that it, it might not be the way we want it to be, but what we can control is what are the things that we can implement that allow us to feel a sense of connection. I do think that holidays, especially for a lot of people can provide a lot of stress, but they can sometimes also provide a lot of warmth and connection. And if you can't build that connection the traditional way by being in person and hug, you know, it may be that, you know, that, that turkey salad sandwich um, in front of a Zoom call and everybody's on that call and everybody's talking to one another and everybody's finding ways to connect. I, I talk with clients too about letter writing. I know it's old school, but I, I love, isn't it nice to go to the mail and like get something like a card and you're like, oh, that just touched me. That really, that really warmed my heart, right? Bringing back some of that, I mean, I think is such a great way to be connected. Here's something I think about when it comes to the holidays. Okay, I don't know if you guys know, but we just had an election. <laughs> so, so with that said, it can be challenging when we have family members who are, um, who are on both sides of the aisle. 
right? And that that is coming up a lot in terms of how people are conversing with one another when they are able to, or if they are able to get together, whether it's, you know, digitally or in person. And I think part of us, part of what we have to do, we have to strategize in terms of planning, planning, what will those conversations look like? How will I handle if there's a, a challenging conversation that presents itself either at the table or online. How do I want this to go? What do I want it to look like? And what am I going to be okay with? So we've got to pay attention to that. I encourage everyone to think about that because we're ripe for it right now. People are really trying to process a lot of feelings, positive and negative and even neutral, just about what has happened when it comes to the election. So, so planning and preparation is, is key. For those who don't necessarily have access to um, large families or friends, I think it's an important time to think about what self-care is going to look like. So Thanksgiving may not be a day to uh, commune perhaps with other people, but maybe it's about being thankful that I, I'm in here right now. And that might mean, you know, um, a warm shower. It might mean watching favorite movies. It might mean other ways of strategizing around how to be, how to use thankfulness and gratitude about where we are and being able to come through this, even if you're not with a lot of other people. Um, overall, when we think about the Naturally Slim program, the, our, our goal is to measurably improve the health of the populations that we work with. We leverage technology to do that. We're able to scale and what I like to say, personalized electrons. We do focus on, on physical health. We, we understand that that weight drives a lot, of, a lot of outcomes as it relates to our overall health, uh, but it also is, there's some psychological components to that, which is why we have uh, Dr. Labat as a part, part of our team. And because people, there are a lot of folks that, that will eat for reasons other than hunger. And I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, Dana, I know when, when I share that. Um, and so we do talk a lot about being able to recognize and be, be mindful of behaviors. And at this time of the year in particular, why am I eating? Why am I maybe drinking uh, maybe more than I should or ought, ought to be potentially? Again, a kind of a slippery slope. Uh, we, we have adult conversations around emotion because that's we're emotional beings, we're hardwired to connect. Um, and within our program, you quite often talk about the acronym RAIN. Uh, share with you, if you would, what RAIN stands for and how we can apply it, hopefully maybe over the next couple of months. Sure. Um, first, has anyone heard of that acronym, RAIN? Okay. Well, I'm so excited to share it with you. Yeah, Todd, thanks for bringing it up. So RAIN, RAIN is an amazing strategy. It's an amazing tool that we often employ to really help us kind of understand what is it that we need right now. And the first, the R stands for recognize. So we recognize not only what's happening around us outside, right? In our environments, whether at home or at work or in schools, wherever, we recognize what's happening not only outside of us, but we also recognize what's happening inside of us. We use observation. We use, you know, these are the feelings that are coming up for me. These are the thoughts that are emerging for me. I like to say, I like to, you know, move from I'm thinking this or um, I, I feel this way to say this is a feeling coming up, right? So you can start to look at it from an observational standpoint. We got to recognize what's happening outside of us and inside of us. The A is for acceptance. So with acceptance, we begin to acknowledge, we acknowledge, as I mentioned before, the acknowledgement, we acknowledge and accept this is what is happening. And we do so without judgment, without judgment. We have a tendency to get real self-critical. I don't know about you, but I know that I can do it if I don't watch myself really carefully. And so the self-criticism we have to put aside and just accept it is what it is. What I've observed that is happening is happening right now, and I'm accepting it. I'm accepting what my emotional experience is. I'm accepting the thoughts that are coming up for me, whether they're negative, whether they're, and when I say negative, I'm, I'm talking about the feelings and the thoughts that make us uncomfortable. Just because they make us uncomfortable don't necessarily make them bad, right? So the A is for the acceptance piece. The I is sometimes we don't know exactly how we're feeling, and we don't know exactly what we need in the moment. And so the I stands for investigate, investigate with kindness. We dig a little bit deeper. You know, what is it? I know something's going on with me. I'm snapping at my kids. I'm, you know, I'm not returning emails. I'm kind of avoiding things. What, 
what is going on with me right now? And again, investigate without judgment and with kindness, right? And then when you can investigate, it helps us identify a deeper experience of what our emotions might be and gets us to the next one, which is nurturing, nurturing our needs. We've got to identify what our needs are and we've got to nurture them with kindness. And we can do that once we've identified what our needs are, then we can actually meet them. So for me, I know that I am not at on the top of my game. I can't even think straight if I don't get a good seven and a half to eight hours of sleep. For me, I just don't function very well. And I try to kid myself that I can, and I really can't. So for me, sometimes it might take a little bit of investigation, not like, Dana, what's wrong with you? Why can't you get it together? That's not helpful to me. What's helpful is, huh, I'm not on my game. What's off? Hmm. Okay. What's off? You know what? I haven't been sleeping very well. So I'm going to nurture that need now and I'm going to prioritize that need. And so we'll use rain as, as a full, well-rounded experience of allowing us to be able to figure out what is it that's happening within us, what's happening around us and how are we understanding it and interpreting it and internalizing it, finding out what we need. And then we nurture ourselves. We meet those needs. Sometimes it could be connecting with other people, but when you're zoomed out, right? When you're zoomed out, you've got fatigue zoom. Maybe you just want to turn it all off and you don't want to talk to anybody. Well, mm -hmm. that might be a need. That might be a need to fill your tank. And so yeah. that's the acronym that we use all the time to really help our participants. And as you know, you know, we talk a lot about the concept of vital needs uh, and those vital needs are unique for everyone. So for you, sleep is a vital need. And I would, you know, I would certainly argue based on evidence that it's a vital need for everyone, even though a lot of us try to try to get by otherwise, but it might be physical activity. For me, that's one of my vital needs. I, it really helps me if I can, you know, if I'm feeling some of the things that you were discussing, if I can go out and just take a quick lap around the block, get some fresh air, a little vitamin D, some intentional deep breathing, and it kind of changes my whole mindset. Uh, it might be quiet time. It might be journaling. There's so many different concepts, but it's different for all of us. But going back to that, that nurturing, we have to be mindful of what it is that it's going to, that's going to work for us. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, going back to that control issue and what you mentioned, which I thought was so interesting is the hands, feet, and mouth. Uh, since March, I've been saying, what, what can we control? There's a lot we can't, but we can control our, our likelihood that we're going to catch the virus. Um, so we can wash our hands, we can socially distance, we can wear masks, we can avoid indoors when possible, et cetera. But the other thing that I think is really, really important is to recognize that physical health and mental health, emotional health are absolutely one and the same. Mm -hmm. So the things that besides sleep that we can be focusing on, regular physical activity and, and proper nutrition, that we're choosing to put good fuel into our gas tank because it's not, we know it's gonna pay off. And so being intentional around the seven and a half to eight hours of sleep, around the physical activity, where again, you don't have to run a marathon. In fact, for many people, that would not be advisable. Um, for a lot of people, it is just walking the dog, even if you don't have one. Uh, and then it would be making you know, healthy choices around food and being mindful that you know, from a coping mechanism, we know statistically, many Americans have gained weight during the quarantine. Um, it's interesting, we've had over 100,000 people go through our Naturally Slim program since the quarantine started, well over 100,000. Uh, they're from all over the country, they're from all different walks of life and ages and genders and you name it, it's all over the map. What we've seen is that on average, women have lost about eight pounds and, and men have lost close to 13 pounds. And, um, and so losing weight and improving your health and your physical activity during a very challenging time is important because being able to manage this and much of what you're talking about, Dana, is just building the skills right. to be able to, to navigate using rain as an example to manage emotions now. Um, let's take it a little step further about the responsibility of leadership because most everybody that's involved in AESA um, has been, either is a leader or has been at some point, a principal, a superintendent, um, and we've got right now, we've got a lot of people that are looking for leadership. So the superintendents are, are in charge of the principals and the principals are in charge of the teachers and the teachers have parents and students that they're trying to manage and lead. So sometimes we have to, to recognize it's important to model behavior, 
but we asked we also have to be careful not to over over give right in terms of compassion fatigue we have a finite supply of giving that that is within our wheelhouse is that safe to say does that make sense yeah, it makes total sense. I mean, we oftentimes, in, in you and I've discussed, and we discussed in the program, you know, really kind of putting your mask on first. And we use that idea from, you know, obviously from flying. And it, it is important in order for us to be available to others to be able to do the work that we want to do and that we're tasked to do, we have to focus on the self care piece first. We have to. It's imperative because if your tank is on E, I always say if you, if you if you're trying to go somewhere, if you've got if you, you you can fill up that car with as many people as possible, but if your tank is on E, you're not going anywhere, right? At all, you're not going anywhere, and so it really is important to be able to take care of the self, recognize what is it again going back to the needs, what is it that we need, and I think. I think what a great example it can be to model. If you're thinking about leadership, it's important to really, I think, model that. And sometimes it seems to fly in the face of what we think about being, a, you know, what a leader is, right? You just give, give, give. But I think how important it is to model that to not only uh, those with whom you work, but those with whom you lead for teachers to be able to pass that on to students, that it's important for you to take care of yourself. And what does self-care look like? What does it look like for you? Because again, it looks different for each person. It might be getting more physical activity, right? For, for some of um, my clients, for example, who are indoors a lot, when they go outside and are able to experience outside, their whole mood changes. Like you mentioned, when you run, your whole mood can change and lift. For another person, it could be reconnecting with someone you know with whom you really care. So figuring out what those needs are and really working to meet those needs, I think does translate into great leadership. It's a tool, it's a skill, and it's a resource that you can model not only for yourself and practice for your own benefit, for but for also for other people. Awesome. Um, Jeff, Becky, Lori, do you guys have any questions or thoughts that you'd like to take and pose to Dr. Labat? Uh, no, I just, I really like the uh, rain idea. I think that's a, something that I can keep in, in mind as I struggle through some of the things that I'm dealing with. Um, you know, and. Uh, my question to you, I, I think my question more is, do you, do you work just only with adults or do you work with students as well? Great question, Jeff. As you certainly know, um, from a health standpoint, uh, anyone under 18 is, is in a, what is defined as a protective class. So we don't have any uh, programs that are directly geared toward kids. That said, um, our, our normal model is we will work with an organization, whatever that looks like. So it could be a school district, uh, it could be a, uh, you know, a service center or a uh, education center. It could be, you know, we work with American Airlines and Google and BNSF and USAA and all sorts of different groups. Um, generally speaking, we will work with the employees and their dependents, their, their spouses or significant, uh, significant others within that population. And obviously many of them are also parents. And so we have a almost an indirect impact on kids. Um, quite frankly, uh, you know, full transparency, I've been working with TASA, the Texas Association of School Administrators, as John well knows, uh, here in Texas. Uh, there's almost 1,200 school dis districts in Texas. So I've been working a lot with TASA over the years. And so what we have found is um, this ability, I get excited about being able to influence in a positive way those that are also in the business of influencing. So when we can help create within a culture, whether it be a school or a district or a family, then there's a lot of fallout. So that's kind of a long answer to your short question. We do not have a specific program, but uh, the Naturally Slim curriculum is grounded in science. It is a behavior-based program that is geared to help people uh, understand that knowledge doesn't change behavior, right? We have Right now we have 42% of American adults are obese. Uh, we have another 30% that are, that are overweight. Um, and we have 88% uh, of American adults, according to the evidence, uh, are suffering, are, are not at a peak metabolically. <clears throat> so when you think about the things that are driving our overall health, um, you know, things like triglycerides and glucose and blood pressure and HDL cholesterol, waist circumference, 
Those are the clinical measures of health, but what's driving that generally has nothing to do with genetics. It has to do with behavior. It has to do with the fact that we live in an obesogenic environment and it's just happened. It's evolved over the course, certainly of my lifetime, uh, but the way we work, the way we eat, the way we live, the way we communicate, um, all of that has changed. And that is what's driving our public health challenges. So from an economic standpoint, uh, depending on the structure of the organization, um, if they're self-funded or I know within education, there's a lot of collaboratives and there's all sorts of different uh, funding mechanisms. And I've yet to meet a school district that has more money than they know what to do with. But our value proposition is, look, at, at, the very, at a very high level, we know that healthy people consume less healthcare. They come to work more often, they're happier, they get more done, and then they're able to leverage their gift. And, and the reason they got into education is to be able to have more energy and feel better about themselves. And so that's really what we're hoping to be able to do uh, it's what we're currently doing, quite frankly, with, I mean, we work with, and just off the top of my head, you know, we work with the Chicago Public Schools, Cleveland Schools, we, um, we work with the Virginia Beach Public Schools, Polk County in Iowa, we work with uh, tons of schools here in Texas, got a big pilot right now with Grapevine, Colleyville ISD. So our, you know, we know that we have an intervention and a solution that can make a measurable difference in the populations of organizations. You know, within your, you know, within your your particular organization or within the districts that you serve, it's really about figuring out ways that we can make it easy. Easy is a big word in, in today's world because everybody, especially in education, has more on your plate than you know what to do with. So it's it's basically identifying and aligning with leadership that says, boy, it'd be awesome if we could help our population improve their physical health, but also improve their mental health. Um, especially now. Clearly, there's <clears throat> massive issues. There's a big article today in the Dallas Morning News about the Girl Scouts of North, North Texas. They, they now have a badge that they can earn around emotional and mental health because depression and anxiety is a big deal in children now, and I know you guys know that. And so how can we, if we can in really kind of equip those that are leading I believe there's going to be a, a great impact uh, within those populations of prioritizing emotional and physical health. So I don't I don't know if that's helpful at all as to, to what we do, but um, <clears throat> we've been at it a while. Um, we've got we have five soon to be six uh, published peer reviewed papers on our outcomes, um, and it's it's very exciting because where a lot of people right now are struggling and heading in a in an unhealthy direction we're able to pretty seamlessly without a lot of heavy lifting, be able to implement a program within populations and make a measurable difference. So don't know if that helps or not at all or not. How about anybody else? Becky or Lori, you guys have any thoughts or questions? I've got a couple chats down here. I'll check that. Nope. Welcome Lori. <laughs> Are you guys okay? Um, Let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, Dana, the, you, you mentioned a couple of times the concept of acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm a basketball fan and you and I have, you know, yeah, I know you're not, but Kevin Love uh, is, if you're an NBA fan, Kevin Love is an all-star player for the Cleveland Cavaliers. <clears throat> and a couple of years ago in 2018, he publicly admitted that he was suffering from depression and anxiety. Uh, he actually had a panic attack in the middle of a game, um, and he won the, the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage in, uh, last year in 2019, or maybe earlier this year, for admitting that. And, and Kevin has this expression that um, everyone is going through something that we can't see. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's something that is important for us today, in, in particular, to recognize we all are in, in the storm but we all are in different boats. And even many times within families, we're in different boats and within school districts or within agencies, everybody's got their own kind of set of challenges and circumstances. Um, you mentioned gratitude, you mentioned grace earlier. Um, now it's not a bad time to double down on those things, right? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and I love the fact that, that Kevin came 
out so publicly to talk about it, right? Because one of the things that we want to try to do is decrease the amount of, um, of shame and secrecy around emotional health and emotional health issues. And I think that gratitude, you know, you talk about it a lot, Todd, when, when you and I talk as well and other talks you've given, but, you know, gratitude is actually shown from a research standpoint to benefit us when we focus and bring ourselves into the present moment and think about the things that we actually are grateful for and, um, and, and actually either write those down or express them or acknowledge them in our heads, it is a centering force. It's a powerful force right now. And I also think that what we need to do with gratitude is add the practice of empathy. As we're going into the holidays, as, as we're coming out of a tumultuous election, it is so incredibly important now to pull on that resource as well, because we are all experiencing a lot. As you mentioned, we're in different boats. We may be in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And it's important, it's important that if we can recognize that we have, we have things that we are grateful for, that we are thankful for, that we can not only give ourselves grace and empathy, but we can also extend that outwardly. So the person who may show up at work um, and may not you know, be participating the same way as usual, or a student who is acting out as a result of, don't, don't bring my own kids into this situation, but you know, virtual schooling, which has been you know, a very interesting experiment, but having the empathy to say- Interesting is an interesting word, right? <laughs> what's that? Yeah, it's been interesting. You know, bringing up grace, just, you know, like, let's just give ourselves a break. Give ourselves a break. And if we can give ourselves a break, then we can extend that to other people. We can extend that break to other people. So when the conversations get heated at the dinner table over this, that, or the other, bringing in, I'm, I'm grateful to just be here with you guys. I, I'm going to extend some of that grace, a little bit of that peace, and a little bit more empathy to say, like, I know that this is hard. And if it's hard, then we can we can take a step back and we can figure out what we need. And sometimes we can also be that instrument to help that other person figure out what he or she or they need to get their needs met. So the grace, the empathy, all of that is incredibly important. The gratitude practice. Now you do something, Todd, that you share all the time. You do it in the morning. So what is it that you do in the morning that, that incorporates this practice? So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you guys that are that are hearing this for the first time. Um, I don't know if you remember there was a I think it was like a Burger King. There was some sort of commercial. Uh, oh, it was the Alka Alka Try it, you'll like it. So <laughs> I encourage you to try this because it has been a game changer for me. And what what Dana's referring to, I call it ALF, A L F, and that stands for at least five. So um, if you've been, you know, if you're like me, you're you know, you're a digital. Uh, immigrant, not a digital native, right? So I learned to communicate face to face before I learned to do this with a phone. Um, that's not the case today, right? Most kids yeah. learn this first and this second. And so um, I've been, I, I study this, the, the, the role of technology, technology in our lives, and I pay a lot of attention to it. And it's interesting how for a lot of people, um, it the phone controls them rather than them controlling the phone. And by, by phone, I mean technology. So that could be, you know, Netflix. It could be, you know, on your, on your laptop, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You guys all know that. And, and it is pretty amazing when you think about the, the gravitational pull that it has. It's magnetic. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I've, I've, I've learned about the concept of what's known as anticipatory anxiety. So for a lot of people that wake up in the morning and the first thing that they do is look at their phone, um, whether it's a tweet, a text, a meme, some sort of headline, it'll instantly activate them. So you're coming out of this hopefully restful bout of sleep and now suddenly you're just you know, hitting the ground, you know, it's, it's jarring. And the research indicates that it has an impact on the quality of your sleep especially the last half of the night, which is where you're getting your restorative sleep with your REM sleep and your deep sleep. So to counter that, I go the opposite way. I wake up in the morning, I go to the bathroom, I feed the dog, I get a cup of coffee or tea, and then I sit down and I just think. No phone, no TV, no radio, no newspaper. I just think. I don't have an agenda. I don't, you know, I don't really have a, any sort of 
you know, outline that I follow, but I try to be intentionally grateful about two things, about something and about someone. Now, the reason I use five minutes is very, very intentional. The research shows if you really think about our health, everything that has to do with our health, and by health, I define it as what is going to define how long and how well you live. And I don't wanna just live, I don't wanna to live to 90 if I'm you know, spending 15 years in an assisted living facility. I want to live well for as long as possible. And if I think about what will help me do that, it all boils down to habits. A habit is something you do without thinking about it, brushing your teeth, tying your shoes, putting the seatbelt on when you get into the car or the truck every day. The, the reality is health is all about habits. It's about 20% genetic and about 80% you. So we control our health. We control our future. And, and so getting into the rhythm of habits, the studies will tell you that set the bar low. Don't try to set it too high. So if I were to ask you to say every morning, get up and do an hour of yoga before you start your day, not, not going to happen. You're out. I've already put the bar too high. Psychologically, you're not even going to give it a shot. So conversely, five minutes. We can, I think we all can invest five minutes and just see how that changes your mindset starting the day. Mm -hmm. To start the day positive, to start the day grateful, to start the day with this control of managing the things in your life that you can manage, being happy and grateful and joyful, you know, David Rast is a Benedictine monk. He's like 94 years old now. And he says, it's not joy that makes us grateful. It's gratitude that makes us joyful. Mm -hmm. So if we're struggling with this, whatever this happens to be, um, starting that day, taking a step back and saying, you know what? I'm not, I can't control this, but there are certain things I can control. And if I look around, there's a whole bunch of things that I should be happy about. I should be grateful about. I'm going to focus on that. And then once I start my day, stuff happens, right? And then you get, you know, you start getting emails and texts and Zoom calls and everything that goes along with that. But the reality is what, for me, it's been a game changer. The other thing is that I do everything possible not to set an alarm so that I wake up when I wake up and I have got the rest and the, the uh, you know, regeneration, so to speak, because sleep is our secret weapon. And right, right now, I think a lot of people are, are running on less than capacity. Uh, it's so, you know, people can get by, but I don't want to get by. I want to thrive. And, um, and thriving in a situation like this sounds for a lot of people a little over the top. But as I mentioned earlier, we've had over 100,000 people go through our program this year, and they're, they're losing weight. They're improving their physical activity just a little bit. They're not becoming triathletes. But but what we start seeing, and we know this for sure, when people lose a little bit of weight, as little as 3% of their body weight, improve their physical activity, metabolically, internally, that engine begins to start getting tuned up. Above the neck, things start becoming a little more manageable. They have a little more confidence. Our quality of life metrics around confidence, mood, energy, those are all up right now during the middle of this pandemic. So it's really fun and gratifying to be able to deliver these kind of solutions and meet people where they live because our technology is delivered, our, our solution is delivered through technology. And to be able to, to hear the stories that we hear and see the results that we do. Um, so I would encourage you, I'm not, not uh, requesting but, or, or demanding, but I just encourage you to give it a shot. You know, try ALF and, and see, and, and don't do it just for a day, do it for two or three days in a row and see if it doesn't change your mindset a little bit and allow you to start the day in a really positive light with some energy. Um, at a very high level, I believe we're all on this earth for a reason and that's to have a positive impact on other people. That's why I love working with people in education because you guys did not get into this field to get rich or get famous. You got into the field to have a positive impact on other people. And sometimes I absolutely know because I've got a bunch of friends in education, it can be a bit overwhelming. I totally understand it, especially now. Um, and the other thing that we really didn't talk about today, that it's virtually impossible now for an educator to, to make a decision that doesn't anger somebody. It's virtually, it's just the world in which we live. Um, but if we can figure out a way to make people feel better, um, I'm reading about the achievement gap and all the challenges with that. I'm reading about turnover. We know now that teacher retention is, is not, not headed in the right direction. Um, 
we need to invest in, in populations and, and do what we can as leaders to influence that. So I wanna be, I, I wanna give everybody a gift today because we're scheduled to go until the top of the hour, but let's, uh, you know, we got, we've got eight minutes. So what I'd love to do is kind of give you the gift of, of some time back um, <laughs> and uh, maybe head outside and take a five minute walk. I would also highly encourage you if you uh, are in a position or have an interest in in learning more about how we do what we do, and, and we do it in a very efficient, um, non-invasive manner for populations. Uh, I think it's something that would be of great value to the uh, the groups in which you're a part of. Love to talk to you about that. You can reach out to John, and John knows exactly how to get a hold of me. Love to talk to you about it if if you have an interest in it. But uh, and it, and if there's anything else in the future that you need, don't feel don't hesitate to kind of reach out. But I, I do want to officially thank uh, Dr. Labat for joining us today uh, for another Zoom call, Dana. I, <laughs> <laughs> now you don't have to look at that that little camera right now for uh, for a while. Uh, take a little break, but thank you for being with us. And uh, if anybody else has any thoughts or questions, I'd be glad to answer them. But John, I'll throw it back to you if that's okay. Uh, tell us about on your website. Can, can people go to your website to learn more information about Naturally Slim? Uh, that's yep. what I was going to ask about. And then, you know, again, if you want to learn more about it even deeper than what's on the website, where you want to learn about how your organization can actually work with Naturally Slim throughout your organization or even within the schools that you serve, please don't hesitate to reach out to them. Uh, re you can reach out to me and I can connect you with, with Todd. Todd, I love Todd's title. We all need this title, Chief Inspirational Officer. Uh, I, I wish that... Uh, I wish that, that I was around more people like that that had that ability. But uh, are there any questions before we before we sign off for the day? I don't want to cut short if somebody has a question, but I don't want to keep everyone on either if, if you don't. So any questions as we close? Oh, thanks. It was um, nice to hear from you guys. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Becky, Lori, hope you guys have a great day. Yeah. Thank right. you very much. Okay. Our pleasure. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, all. John, I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye, Appreciate everyone. Appreciate it, Dana. Bye, guys.